E, sıradaki sunumu yapmak üzere birazdan Sayın Donald Akuli ile burada olacak. Donald Akuli ile Tarım ve Kırsal Kalkınma Bölümünden mezun olmuştur ve politika ve strateji geliştirme, programlama ve uygulama konularında 20 yıldan fazla bir deneyime sahiptir. Çeşitli kamu görevlerinde bulunmuş ve hem kamu yönetimi hem de uluslararası hibe projeleri kapsamında birçok Avrupa Birliği üyesi ve Avrupa Birliği üyesi olmayan ülkede çalışmıştır. Bu Malta'daki Kırsal Kalkınma için Avrupa Fonu Yönetim Otoritesi Başkanlığı, Brüksel'deki Avrupa Kırsal Kalkınma Ağı ve diğer ülkelerle birlikte Kıbrıs'ın kuzey, kuzey, kuzey kesiminde üstlendiği görevleri içermektedir. Küçük Malta Adası'ndan gelen Donald Akulina için sürdürülebilir tarım çalışmalarında her zaman bir öncelikti. Bu konu aynı zamanda daha, gene, daha geniş yerel tarım toplulukları ve kırsal işletmeler arasında sürdürülebilir tarım uygulamalarını ve iş fırsatlarını teşvik eden Kıbrıs'ın kuzeyindeki tarımsal danışmanlık hizmetlerine yönelik Avrupa Birliği Teknik Yardım Projesi ekip lideri olarak şu anki görevinin de merkezinde bulunmaktadır. Sayın Akulina. Good afternoon, everyone. So, thanks for the introduction, Ozge. I also wanted to add that, uh, apart from that, I'm also a, a farmer. So I'm also uh, quite proud to stand in front of you, also hearing various colleagues speaking about agriculture, rural tourism, and stuff like this. Um, and also, it was a real pleasure to come across during the lunch uh, with some colleagues, with some farmers that we've been working with. So. It was. Uh, it made me f me feel comfortable rather than having to face uh, architects and civil engineers. But there's also colleagues from the farming sector <laughs> today. So yes, I mean I'm here representing the Farm Advisory Services uh, project. I'll talk uh, about that uh, later on in the presentation. Maybe I'll start with uh, touching some some issues, some aspects um, in a wider context about agriculture and the implications of that. Uh, for uh, Northern Cyprus. So, so yeah, I mean, to start with, we've seen some very nice uh, pictures about uh, the, the tulips and the babazi, the daffodils, the, the orchids, and all the flora and fauna and so on and so forth. Uh, Many, many of that is actually one thing is uh, is found on actual agricultural land, farmland uh, managed by the farmers. So one already starts to think about how can one can combine uh, or what's the, where we can strike the balance between actually uh, modern agricultural practices, intensive agricultural practices, uh, being viable, being for profitable, but at the same time preserving. Uh, the natural landscape, the cultural landscape, uh, and all that's around. So that's one big challenge. Uh, obviously, ar around that, uh, there is this uh, notion about the social acceptability. And uh, again, uh, many times we've seen some very nice pictures about uh, the landscape, the nature. Uh, in reality, many of these places are also maintained are also managed by the farmers. So with that in mind, um, uh, farmers play a very important role, agriculture plays a very important role when we speak about public goods. Uh, the role of the farmer in contributing uh, in preserving the landscape, preserving the natural uh, environment for the benefit, not just of themselves in terms of a co commercial um, uh, profitable income, but also about the benefits of that for the general community to enjoy the landscape, to enjoy the nature, and uh, the recreational benefits out of that. And obviously, the environmental integrity, as we mentioned, so the need to strike a balance between um, producing, but producing in a sustainable way, um, observing and uh, the, the uh, protecting natural resources, the landscape, the features therein, uh, and ensuring uh, that uh, the practices that are employed are not damaging the environment. So here I also have a, a bunch of images from Northern Cyprus. 
Um, we've heard already from some of the presentations about the different opportunities and challenges that uh, some of these aspects bring. We've heard uh, nicely from many about the habitats, the biodiversity, um, the cultures, the values. Um, the, also, the other dimensions around this, which are, for example, climate change, um, the need to adapt, to think, to mitigate, um, to develop strategies about uh, what's going to happen in the next five, ten years. We've seen this as a picture actually from last year's storm here in Lapta, which made a disaster basically because of the lack of planning infrastructural means to mitigate such uh, calamities basically. Or the other way around, the drought aspects. Um, the food and the feed also. Um, here, if I move yeah, if I move to this slide, I mean, we've heard about statistics and numbers. I'm not going to do the details of all of this, but um, just, uh, for example, on the aspect of food um, uh, and the role of agriculture. I mean, if one thinks that, for example, nowadays in Europe on an annual basis, uh, around 88 million tons of food is wasted annually. And the value of that is, comes to around 135 billion euros annually. So that's just in Europe. So you can imagine the impact of agriculture, and not just agriculture, actually the way of, of uh, the pattern of consumption um, uh, and the, the way that the food is um, uh, produced, marketed, and arrives to the consumer, all the waste around that, and the, and the pressure of that on the, on the water resources, on the land, so on and so forth. I mean, water quality, I mean, like, um, I think it's one of the important aspects here for Cyprus, I mean, with the drought issues that, that prevail, um, and the importance of uh, not just agriculture, but actually agriculture plays an important role, um, because, again, looking at some numbers, some statistics, 45% of actually all the EU waters are polluted from agricultural sources, fertilizers, waste, manure, and stuff like this. Uh, and we see here, for example, nitrates in groundwater. I mean, in general, um, there, is, there are limitations because of safety reasons. Uh, the limitation in the EU is 50 milligrams per liter of nitrates in, in water. Um, we see that overall, the statistics from Cyprus, but these are mainly coming from the Republic of Cyprus, are just right uh, below the uh, maximum amounts. But I also want to mention that I've seen uh, some shocking results of water being tested in the, in the northern part from farm, from farm wells where the amount of nitrates were even up to 200 milligrams per liter. And this water is being used for the farmers, not just to, to supply the animals on the farm, but also for the, fa for, for the family to drink, to wash, and to make on a day, day, on a day to day basically use. And for those who don't know, High nitrates in water are one of the main co um, uh, causes of uh, breast cancer or blue babies and stuff like this. So it's very serious stuff here. Um, the other aspect that I wanted to touch uh, about is that, I mean, so far we have also we heard a lot about standards, um, uh, construction, uh, material stuff and things like that, regulation. Um, but many times we uh, things stop there and very little has been mentioned about the importance of education. So yes, it's importance of, of, of uh, regulation, control, but also uh, likely and more importantly also the, the need to educate. And here if we look at, for example, statistics on the level of education uh, and, the, and obviously around that the, the level of awareness of the farming community in Cyprus, we see that very few farmers are really educated, know exactly what they are doing, why they are doing, how they need to produce, what tools and techniques and, and technology they need to, to, to use, very little. And this has a huge impact on the sustainability of their practices. So here I just wanted to move then now about uh, the discussions that are ongoing and the importance of all of this at the EU level. So for those who are familiar with the programming cycle in the EU, there are programs uh, which uh, are, have a lifetime of seven years. We are now uh, on the 
uh, at the phase where we are the programming period which which span between 2014 2020 is coming to an end is being concluded but there are a lot and, uh, of discussions going on on the new common agricultural policy so the common agricultural policy basically is a, as, it, as its name implies a common policy for all EU member states uh, in terms of support regulation and, uh, and promotion of agricultural uh, activities so under the new cap proposals for the new, next seven years you see that um, many many aspects many many strategic object objectives are linked with sustainability i will not go into each and every one of them but maybe pick up a couple of these which are relevant especially for the local situation we've heard about um, the issue of um, agricultural sustainability in the first place so and the viability of these farms here in the northern part of Cyprus, we, are, we have an agricultural sector which is mainly dominated by very small farmers, farms, fragmented holdings. Um, and most of, these are, uh, most of these farms are not viable, are not competitive. The economies of scale, the, the issue of cost, geo geopolitical situation, so on and so forth. So, um, the current situation also with, with regards to production doesn't help. So whilst in other countries um, most of the policies, most of the programs are earmarked to try and uh, increase the profitability for the farmer by uh, what they call integrating them in the food value chain, so ensuring that the end, at the end when the farmer sells his product, his potatoes, his milk, whatever it is, uh, most of that money remains in the pocket of the farmer. Here we have a situation where basically most of that money is ending up in the pockets of the retailers, supermarkets, uh, stuff like this. So very little in the pockets of the farmer itself. So one way to mitigate that is actually to um, uh, empower the farmer, encourage them to make use of um, opportunities like rural tourism case in point, sell directly, uh, promote directly, ensure better standards, better quality, diversify your production, try to meet the consumer's needs. One other important challenge that I see here is also the generational gap. So you have also a farming structure with uh, over 80% of the farmers are over 60 years, most of them actually into their 70s, and very few young farmers coming into the business, very few are attracted to this, uh, to this sector. So uh, in the next coming years, if there is no real, um, uh, no, no, no, no real actions being taken, so there, there will be uh, a lot of problems arising from this, uh, mainly through land abandonment, um, exploitation of actually also the uh, construction industry taking up more land and stuff like this. So something needs to be really done, both in terms of education but also in terms of providing the, the necessary incentives, the right incentives to attract and keep these people in the rural areas and into the agricultural sector. Okay. So here I'm not going to the details of, and the, tech, the, the technical aspects of all of this, but just to mention that in the EU, agriculture uh, is supported uh, in two main ways. So common agricultural policy is, uh, is split, as they say, into two main pillars, pillar one and pillar two. Pillar one is, uh, acknowledges, basically, the importance of agriculture and farmers and farming uh, when it comes to the landscape, the, nat the natural environment, and the importance of the, the farmers to protect that. So, in many instances, we see a lot of support being pumped to farmers to, um, uh, into, in schemes that uh, encourage them to maintain these landscape features, to adopt uh, good agricultural and environmental practices on their farms to preserve the habitats and the biodiversity of the farms. And obviously, uh, these activities, these actions, obviously, many times mean that the farmer loses um, uh, from his production, and these schemes are there to compensate for that loss of production, for additional costs that the farmer incurs to actually undertake such practices. Um, then there is also the second pillar, 
which is the rural development pillar. And here we see more a different type of support, which are more grant-based, um, uh, investment-based support. So farmers are given financial support to invest and adopt new techniques, new technology, new practices, um, to modernize, to innovate, but always um, keeping in mind and actually the conditionality for both uh, pillars, uh, the um, compliance with minimum standards, minimum standards in relation to environment, animal welfare, hygiene, food safety issues and stuff like this. So, as I mentioned, I mean, there are, uh, yes, farmers are supported, agriculture is in general supported, but this comes also with a um, corset of obligations. So, in the EU, we, found, we, we see that, as I mentioned, CAP payments are linked with uh, sustainable agricultural practices, um, what we uh, call cross compliance. Um, cross compliance are basically composed of two different types of uh, obligations. Um, the first set of obligations are called statutory management requirements, which are basically um, um, a collection of 13 different directives uh, dealing with environment, water, feed, food, um, animal health, animal welfare, so on and so forth. So basically farmers, uh, to get any form of support, even actually not to get any support, but they are still obliged to uh, adopt and comply with all these standards. And in, in the EU, the ministries of agriculture mainly are, uh, are the competent bodies to control and to ensure that these are, um, um, these are observed. We've heard from our colleague this morning uh, the presentation on the artificial intelligence and the use of GIS. So basically, it is an obligation actually in new member states to have such systems. So paying agencies, paying agencies are basically bodies which are managing these payments, which are uh, managing and regulating and actually affecting the payments, use such technology to control, as we've, we've seen here this morning, um, who is doing what, how much the farmer is actually should be paid, and if they are not complying, how much of that payment should be deducted also. So there are also penalties and sanctions for, for non-compliance. Um, here in the northern part of Cyprus, obviously these requirements, uh, not being a new member state in the north, and obviously there's the suspension, so to say, so far of the EU key adoption, although there, is, there was some movement in certain aspects of the Aki, especially in Chapter 12, which deal with veterinary services, phytosanitary, and so on. Uh, there was some approximation in legislation, but when it comes to agriculture, it's, uh, we're still miles away from um, uh, ensuring at least that the legislation is in line with EU requirements. So obviously around that, there are still supports to the farmers, there are various forms of uh, grants and subsidies which are paid on an annual basis. But unfortunately, when it comes to especially local um, funding, uh, farmers are given uh, millions of tele every year, but these are not coupled, like we heard in the EU, with the obligation to observe these um, rules, these regulations, these standards. So yes, farmers are getting subsidies, but uh, we see very little actually impact of these subsidies on the ground. Uh, so this is something that needs to change and has to change basically, because um, one needs to also realize that these, this money is not, um, this money is coming from taxpayers' money, and, tax, and, and taxpayers, rightly so, um, should get some benefit in return for these subsidies. And as we heard, the issue of public goods should and the notion of public goods should start to be introduced and farmers should be made aware about these obligations and, uh, and the need to respect more and to adopt more sustainable agricultural practices. Um, there is also the EU, which is present here as a donor. Uh, I will explain a bit later about the various opportunities that arise, but, also, but there we see that in, um, with the difference grants that are provided under the EU, especially in the area of agriculture, farmers are supported twofold. One, on one end, to 
invest in uh, uh, in, in activities, technology, techniques, infrastructure to help them meet these standards, um, but also in other uh, activities, other machine, other equipment, which actually go beyond uh, these minimum standards. So twofold. I mean, we've heard also a lot about tourism, construction, uh, many other aspects. But uh, what we see, and this is not also an issue just of the northern part of Cyprus, but I mean, this is an issue uh, across the globe. Many times, um, uh, there is a lack of synergy between the policies. So yes, it's amazing to, to see, I mean, what the country has to offer in terms of tourism. But how, does that, how is that reflected in the tourism policy, if there is a policy or tourism strategy? Likewise, in the, in the agriculture, I mean, there is no, uh, there is actually um, not even an agricultural policy in place, not, not even a rural development strategy in place. So there is a disconnect between all these parts, all these elements. Uh, and this is where one needs to start to work with building synergies, building bridges between all these aspects to ensure sustainability. I mean, we heard about infrastructure again, but I mean, many times the thinking starts and ends with urban planning. What about rural planning? What about agricultural planning? What about, for example, infrastructure, road access to farms, infrastructure about water, uh, broadband, uh, electri electricity. Many of these farms that we find around rural areas don't have any electricity, any water supply, uh, any, any kind of um, facility to dispose of waste. So there is the need to start thinking and synergizing about these policies. Uh, the governance issue also. So many times uh, we see that policies, programs, strategies, whatever it is, is, it is uh, are uh, designed, developed and implemented for, with a top-down approach. Uh, very few uh, times we've seen that the real uh, actors, the real stakeholders are also consulted on their needs, on their issues, on their challenges, uh, on their experiences, because they will also, I mean, everyone has to has uh, lessons to, to learn and to share from. And this also has to change, uh, because in order to implement, in order for these activities to be successful, um, you need ownership, you need to empower these people. And as I mentioned before, the importance to start coupling, linking, any form of subsidies, any form of incentives with some basic uh, obligations. Many times, and it's unfortunate to say, um, yes, education is very important, but many times, uh, especially with the farming community, you need to slap a bit the hands of the farmers in order to, for them to adopt these practices and to actually um, change their mentality, make the shift in the, in the way they, they, uh, they work and they, and they farm. So, yes, um, uh, there is also uh, various um, tools, approaches, uh, innovative aspects. We hear some of them this morning um, that can ensure, can, can catalyze the, this process. As I mentioned, the investments in physical assets on farms. So, various opportunities there uh, in terms of adopting, as I said, I mean, aspects like renewable energy, for example. Um, how we can ensure viability of the farms, but still maintain and preserve the natural environment or reduce the carbon footprint of these farms. I mean, renewable energy is a classic example, and especially here in the northern part of Cyprus where we have, I guess, 11 and a half months of sunshine. It's a classic no-brainer, I mean, not to, not to go for it, basically. Um, issues of waste and stuff like this, we'll hear, I guess, from our colleague Nicole later on about all, also about these aspects. Knowledge transfer cooperation um, and also demonstration activity. Many times farmers, um, yes, you can bring farmers in the room, you can, you, you can provide lectures, uh, PowerPoint notes and whatever, but uh, many times uh, all of this falls on deaf, deaf ears, basically, if I can put it like this. So farmers want to see, want to taste, want to feel, and uh, one uh, innovative way of dealing of doing that is to actually demonstrate 
uh, how a new technology, how a new practice, how a new technique can actually make their life better, make their pockets also better, feel better. Um, so this is, an, this is an important aspect that also, I guess in other areas, um, should be explored, should be incentivized, and should be promoted better. I think also, for me, this, this conference actually today is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a very important step in that direction, and the fact that um, uh, I actually want to compliment the organizers for bringing different sectors, different interest groups together, uh, and sharing these experiences is the right way, the right uh, direction to take. Uh, networking. Again, I like to maybe link the uh, link back to the presentation uh, on rural tourism. Uh, I've been here for already three years, basically, and uh, I'm as keen as uh, as any other tourist to to try and taste and experience local cuisine, local, local experience, the nature, and so on. But I must say that maybe one deficiency is the marketing aspect, the connectivity between the different actors in, in, these, uh, in, in this economy. So how much farmers are involved in this? How much is actually the, the products are capitalized? Are, I mean, I, I, to be honest myself, I barely find any information. If I want to go on a tour, if I want to go on a food tasting experience, I don't know where to start from. So marketing is also, marketing and networking, bringing these sectors together is also a, an important step to ensure sustainable practices in this area. And research, obviously, um, uh, when we speak about research, basically it's not about um, creating uh, new research facilities or to try to reinvent the wheel, but actually a lot of research, a lot of knowledge uh, is already there. It's just about how to uh, think of clever ways, how to bring that knowledge, bring actually apply science to, to the farm, to the, to the real practices, which actually can improve also a lot of this, this aspect that I mentioned. So, as I mentioned, I mean, uh, the EU is doing quite a lot here, has been present for several years. Um, I've mentioned that there are, there have been so far actually five grant schemes that have been launched by the EU. Four have been uh, contracted, evaluated, and projects are ongoing. Um, there, were, there have been a total of 235 actually projects so far uh, implementing, implemented or are being concluded now to the tune of 13.8 million euros, so it's quite a big chunk of money. Also at the moment there's another grant scheme which is under evaluation, which has a value of 5 million euros. And uh, I can say, because as a project we have been supporting uh, farmers in uh, conceptualizing their project ideas, preparing their replications and so on, that there, have, there, there are many, many interesting uh, ideas connected to all of this, uh, trying to capitalize from tourism, from more uh, economic viable practices like renewable energy, and so on and so forth. Um, maybe taking the, one, of the, one of these aspects in terms of uh, knowledge development, knowledge transfer, exchange, cooperation, this is where maybe the, the projects that the project we are working with plays a key role. So as I mentioned, we are uh, working with farm advisory services. Maybe the name is a bit misleading because we are not just dealing with actually farm uh, uh, only or farmers only, but we are the, the notion and the reach of the, of the project is wider than that. We're dealing with actually the agriculture, the rural areas, the rural development aspects of that. And we are basically uh, in the second phase of the project. So this project was launched uh, in 2016. There was a, a three-year phase, phase uh, of the project. Under that project, uh, the main need or the main objective of that was uh, there was uh, an acknowledgement of the importance to educate, to train, to provide services for the farmers to improve, to adopt these practices. Uh, so under the first project, we supported uh, Turkey Cypriot community to develop a strategy. So there is an advisory services strategy. Uh, we assisted also 
uh, in establishing various structures that are dealing with the management, the operations, and the delivery of these services. And the idea of the project was also to uh, work with, engage, and build the local capacity when it comes to actually the delivery part of the services. So I'm actually also proud to say that we managed to identify, train, and certify 54 um, uh, local advisors. Local advisors with expertise in various domains, agriculture engineers, veterinarians, accountants, economists, so basically a broad range of expertise. And these expertise are mobilized through the project to support the farmers, but not just farmers, also um, agri-process enterprises, rural entrepreneurs in, uh, in, a very, in various ways, basically, which I will explain. Um, so far, we've had over 900 consultations. Most of these consultations were delivered as a one-to-one, -one, so quite a lot of, of work, quite a lot of effort there. And over 450 farmers have benefited from, from these. Uh, most of the information that has been generated, the documents that we have produced, are already uh, hosted uh, as part of the uh, project website. You can find the address there, so I encourage you also to visit the website. There's a lot of information there. Um, and now we are basically in the second phase of uh, this project. So the second phase is another three-year project, um, uh, but the the main mandate is now to move into actual um, service delivery. So working hand in hand with the farmers to now to promote, to educate, to train in the applications of these techniques, obligations, technology, and so on and so forth. And also assisting them uh, to access financial support. So EU grants and other kind of credit facilities to help them then uh, transform their ideas, uh, capitalize from the business opportunities, and make necessary investments on their farms. So, as I mentioned, I mean, so far farm advisory services are offered to uh, all farmers, livestock, crop, and also other rural enterprises. Um, through the project, the, these services are offered free of charge, basically, so all the farmers are getting all this support, one-to-one -one support, um, um, tailor-made to a variety, variety of services. So, spending from advice on minimum standards, so basically have advisors going on their farms, analyzing the situation, advising them on issues of productivity, minimum standards, infrastructural needs, uh, preparing farm investment plans, and then supporting also um, elements linked with marketing, with their production, and finally, as I mentioned, uh, facilitating the access to credit facilities, whether it's a grant, but also hopefully in the future, also other um, financial instruments like loans, guarantees, and so on, which might be offered by the market. Um, here, maybe before we start, um, I wanted to show you actually a short video, which is uh, which was uh, shot at the end of the uh, of the last project, which ended in December last year. We started this new project in January, so which is still a couple of months, so to say, into into implementation. And uh, I wanted to to show this this video for two main reasons mainly. So one, obviously. Uh, to, um, in terms of uh, raising your awareness about the project, our activities, uh, and, uh, and what, we're to, what we're doing on the field. But also to hear, we'll see various interviews with a variety of farmers, and it's interesting to hear from them the ideas, actually, that they have, the, the project ideas that they came with. Uh, and I think this is, this is a, there is a, a very interesting opportunity to think about and to start joining the dots in terms of uh, creating these synergies, like I mentioned before. So I need something to cut ahead. Tarım Danışmanlık Hizmetleri Projesi, Kıbrıs Türk Toplumu için verimli yerel çiftlik danışmanlık hizmetleri kurmayı amaçlayan ve Avrupa Birliği tarafından desteklenen bir teknik yardım projesidir. Bu hizmetler tarım sektörünün gelişimi için birinci derecede önemlidir ve Avrupa Birliği'nin ortak tarım politikasının ayrılmaz bir parçasıdır. Yapılandırılmış sistem ve hizmetlerin yokluğunda proje etkili bir danışmanlık sisteminin geliştirilmesi için çok önemli bir rol oynamaktadır. Güzel bir proje. 
merkezinde, Narinci öğretimiyle çalışıyoruz. Yuvacık'ta olsun, Güzel Yurt Merkezi'de olsun. 330 dönüm arazi üzerinde. Yani aileden gelmelidir. Dededen, e, arpa, buğday, yonca, kuş yemi, e, bu gibi bitkisel üretimler. Yeşil Yurt'ta 235. Suha Birliği'ni temsil ediyorum. 149 kayıtlı üyemiz var. E, kooperatifimizde e, Seracılıkla uğraşanımız var Güneşköy'de üyelerimizden. Ee, nar üretimi yapan arkadaşlarımız var. Narinciye ile uğraşan arkadaşlarımız var. 50 yaşındayım. Hayvancılıkla uğraşıyoruz. 190 hayvanımız var. Erdemli köyünde yapıyoruz. Bundan 6 yıl önce burada zeytin dikmeye karar verdik. Zeytinlerimizi diktik, bahçemizi çevreledik. Kuyumuzu kazdık, suyumuzu bulduk. Ee, fidanlarımız yavaş yavaş büyümeye başladı. Bütün zeftelerden ekliyoruz. Seralarımız var. Onlar da domates, salatalık, biber, tatlıcan. E, dört koloni satın aldım. Ve o şekilde aracılığa başladım. Ardından e, Aracılar Birliği'ne kayboldum. Şimdi 35 kolonim var. E, babam hayvancı, dedelerim çobandı, tarımla uğraşırlardı. Böyle bir geçmişim var. E, çok severek yapıyordum mesleğimi. Bunu hani danışmanlık şeklinde çok yapmak isterdim ve bir fırsat buldum. E, tüm bilgi birikimini, deneyimini e, üreticilerle paylaşmak e, benim için son derece önemliydi. Tarım danışmanlık hizmetlerinden Avrupa Birliği'nin bilgilendirme toplantısında haberim oldu. Avrupa Birliği'nin e, bize sunduğu bu gide programları sayesinde e, ilk e, grantını aldıktan sonra 4 milyon bir modern serak kurdum. Fas ekibin bize sunduğu hizmetler eğitimler sayesinde e, bu zorlukları diğer öğretilerin çekmesi için bu eğitimlere katıldık. Proje uygulamasının ilk aşılması sırasında tarım ve kırsal danışmanlık sisteminin kurulması için bir strateji geliştirilmesine yönelik çalışmalar başlatılmıştır. Bu strateji Kıbrıslı Türk paydaşlarla istişare edilerek tasarlanmış ve gereken yapıları, önemli olan sistemleri ve sunulacak hizmet elpazesini içeren tüm kilit unsurları kapsayan bir yol haritası oluşturmuştur. Stratejinin uygulanması, gözetim sağlayan bir yönlendirme kurulunun oluşturulması ve sistemin işletme yönetimi koordinasyonu ve değerlendirilmesiyle görevlendirilmiş bir tarım danışmanlık hizmetleri merkeziyle devam etmiştir. Geniş bir uzmanlık elpazesine sahip 38 yerel danışman eğitilmiş, sertifikalandırılmış ve ardından tarım danışmanı olarak görevlendirilmiştir. Ben aslında şey düşünüyorum, bir akıllı sera, çilek serası düşünüyorum. Bal evinden kovanlarımın üretimine kadar Avrupa standartlarına uygun e, altyapı oluşturulmasıydı hedefim. Benim projeye başvurmamdaki amaç solar enerji. Çevreyi koruma, çevre dostu olması dolayısıyla. Proje fikrim, e, e, Yonca'nın verimini artırabilmek için toprak altı damla sulama. Seçilen bir havuza girdik. E, kalite insanlar ve e, farklı meslek gruplarının olduğu e, bir alana girdik. Pasaki burada çok e, akıllıca bir davranış e, sevgilerek bu kurumun içerisinde sadece ziraatçileri değil hem e, muhasebeciler hem işletmecileri de koyarak çiftçilikten değil daha sonra şirketleşmeye ve profesyonelleşmeye adım atmalarını sağlayan servis ya da bir yol arkası çizmesi e, bence çok olumlu olmuştur. Dünyayla bu konuda rekabet edebilecek aşamalara üreticilerimizi getirmek ve dünya pazarına belki de ülkemizi daha çok tanıtmak bizler için çok mutluluk verici olacaktı. Tabii biz yani bu üretime bir katma değer kattıysak danışman olarak yani benim için çok tabii ki kişisel olarak çok tatmin edici. Başta ben vazgeçmek istedim. Sağ olsun beni ikna etti. Bayağı bir prosedürü şeyi vardı. Almam gereken evrakları alamamıştım. Onun sayesinde devam ediyoruz yani şu anda. Nasıl e, bu süreçten faydalanabiliriz. Danışman arkadaşlar sağ olsun çok yardımcı oldular, çok bilgilendirici oldular. Yani asla yapamazdık. Yani danışman çok önemlidir. Yönlendirme açısından gerçekten yani bu işin başı danışmandır desem olur. Kendimizi bir hayvancı olarak özel hissettik. 
ilk defa başvurduğum için neyin nasıl yapılacağını bilmiyordum. Burada görevli arkadaşlar tüm yönleriyle yardımcı oldular. Çok memnunum. Biraz da olsun hayal kurdurabilmek e, çok önemli bir olaydı benim için. Yani yaşadığım deneyimlerden e, dinlendiklerini ve değerli olduklarını hissettirdiler bana e, konuştuğunda ve çok değerliydi benim için. Sistem ve hizmetler gerçekleştirilen bir pilot uygulama sırasında test edilmiş, geliştirilmiş ve iyileştirilmiştir. Şu anda danışmanlar, proje tekliflerini hazırlamak için Avrupa Birliği'nin tarıma dayalı yatırımın desteklenmesi başlıklı teklif çağrısı kapsamında yaklaşık 500 potansiyel faydalanıcıyı desteklemektedir. So basically, out, out of this, I wanted to extract a couple of points, basically, about the opportunities that exist, basically, for, for uh, local agriculture, local farmer, farming community. So if you have already about opportunities from uh, diversified services, so moving away from the classical idea that farmers are there to produce tomatoes, potatoes, fruit, vegetables, or milk, or whatever it is, but also they have a key, a crit a key role in also contributing to uh, a variety of services. Uh, and this, actually, they need to also, this is important, that they need to capitalize from these opportunities. Um, um, the importance also, uh, thinking also uh, on a longer term on climate change challenges, so how to mitigate these uh, these risks, how to mitigate um, these, uh, these these these uh, challenges basically, and uh, basically we have a situation here uh, where uh, planning, especially in terms of agriculture, starts and ends on the farm, and this has to also change or end. Uh, many, uh, basically, for to ensure sustainability of agricultural practice, one needs to start and to think from the market. So, what the consumer needs, uh, what's available, what's not, what kind of business opportunities do, do, do, do, do, does the farmer have? Uh, unfortunately, here we see a situation where farmers are anchored to their traditions, to their pasts and because their grandfathers, their parents used to produce wheat, used to produce watermelons or tomatoes, they keep doing so without any um, business notion, basically. Uh, in a country where, you are, where there is water scarcity, to produce, for example, watermelon is a no-brainer when it's one of the uh, crops which is, I mean, requires a huge amount of water, for example, just to mention an example. I mean, uh, same thing with the, with the milk industry. I mean, 90% of the milk is produced from cows, from cattle, uh, where they require huge amount of, they, uh, they, they actually one of the most heavy polluters in the system. Um, I've heard yesterday, we heard presentations about the problem of waste and uh, basically the opportunity, what does not exist at the moment here on bio waste and biogas. Um, uh, when you have actually, per tradition, a huge sector, a huge actually market opportunity linked with Helen production for sheep and goats. So these issues need to be taught more through and incentivized properly. Um, the issue of again of uh, climate change and um, uh, and basically green, uh, the air air quality and the, the importance of investing both in protecting but also in, the, in the encouraging establishment of new forestry, new new uh, new land being transformed into into uh, forestry land. And as we heard, the importance that uh, knowledge development, knowledge transfer advice has in catalyzing all of this. So basically, uh, it's about how we can achieve more, but by using less. So here I took the liberty of our lunch. Basically, I was inspired by the inspiration from our uh, by the presentation from our colleague this morning about the monastery in the Kairina Mountains and the use of materials and so on. And again, this struck 
me in terms of uh, what's the situation when it comes to farm buildings, to agriculture, uh, infrastructure. I'm not sure whether this is the same monastery that was uh, showed by our colleague, but it's also in the Kyrena Mountains, but with a, with a difference because basically uh, the area around this monastery is uh, dotted with farms, but farms which are of this type and this condition, basically, as we see in the other picture, using basically all kinds of conventional materials, bricks, concrete, um, uh, metal sheets, and all this, all kinds of stuff, which def definitely do not, are, don't go hand in hand with the um, natural or cultural heritage that we see in the other picture. And also, this brings another aspect about maybe your role as civil engineers and architects in the planning, in the programming, and in the advice that we need to provide to the farming communities. So far, there are no standards, there are no guidelines when it comes to agricultural construction, agricultural infrastructure, how farms should be developed, how, what kind of materials should be used. I mean, we see farms uh, using corrugated metal sheets for the for shedding of their animals. When, I mean, basically, in temperatures of 40 degrees, 38 degrees, basically we are microwave, microwaving or cooking basically the cows or the sheep and goes underneath. So it doesn't make any sense. So use, using basically all the inappropriate materials for the current climate and the current type of production. So here again I see a very important opportunity to cooperate with the farming sector to develop the right guidelines, the right plans, the right um, advice to start this change. And uh, last but not least, I mean, this is again um, uh, from Eurostat, you mentioned about statistics and so on. Um, as you see, these are, this is a, an image about the vulnerability index of, uh, in terms of European countries. And as you see, basically Cyprus is on the hot end and on the risky, on the risky side of things when it comes to droughts, floods, uh, the decline in the agriculture, the economic activities because of all these natural calamities that are expected, like we heard also from other colleagues. So one needs to pull their sleeves now. I think it's, it's already late, but uh, to start with the appropriate planning uh, and actions basically to mitigate and adapt uh, the current situation. Finally, again coming to the issue of statistics, um, I mentioned Eurostat, so uh, for those who don't know, you can visit this website. Basically, all EU member states are obliged to provide this data, so you can find country data sets on all the SDG indicators, so you can go compare, see what's the situation in other countries, how we're featuring. And finally, as I mentioned, it would be good also to hear from some of you and make the connection with our project, so those are our contact details. And uh, I, uh, I look forward to uh, for further cooperation, both with the, uh, with the with the chamber. I I know it's sad that the project is coming to an end, but definitely it will not be the uh, last opportunity uh, in terms of cooperation between the chamber and the project. Thank you for everything. Thanks for your attention. I don't know if there are any questions at this point. I'm going to leave it for later. So, as an out-of-the-box question, um, as a technical team leader in agriculture, maybe a suggestion for future projects. Um, so. I'm not a farmer, a normal person, let's say. So do you think people like me should be educated? I don't know if there's such a term like backyard farming. So produce your own food in small scale, I mean. Because as far as I heard, the world is leaning towards something like that to promote people to produce their own food for for a sustainable future, maybe. So do you think this is an effective way to go for it? Or this, is, this should be replaced with more mass production in farming? And do you think um, this will be supported by EU, so educating 
normal people, non farmers, for such productions? I mean, in terms of, uh, I don't know if you speak about the, whether a project or not can be uh, uh, accepted or not in this sense, but I, I take the point that basically, in terms of awareness raising and education, these are this is a critical aspect. So, we're, yes, I mentioned education and awareness raising amongst the farming community, but likewise, and uh, I would say even more importantly, or likewise importantly, is the consumer, the general public. So, how much or how many of you know about what is produced, where it is produced, how it was produced, where it is coming from? Um, this is one, one important thing to start from. I mean, I, me, as a consumer, as a foreigner, maybe here in this country, it's actually a frustration even for me to go on a market and uh, I see most of the stuff which is being imported when you have similar products, even better quality, uh, which is not there. Uh, basically because the retailers, the retailers are dominating the market and obviously, linked to your point, the consumer is not aware to look, to ask for uh, what is this product, where is it coming from, when it was produced, uh, who produced it. So in the EU, the EU yes, you find this, this uh, has moved quite a lot so in terms of uh, there's actually the launch of a new strategy from farm to fork uh, for the new cap. Uh, it's all about traceability, it's all about consumer awareness. Um, and this is the important, the, the starting point. We hear also about um, the use of materials. Maybe if I can make a, a correlation with the, with the example of using existing materials, reducing the footprint. Um, we have, I mean, excellent produce, ec excellent products, but they are, uh, it's, it's very, it's very little, little information. Again, the issue of, of hotels that we hear. I mean, you go, you go to hotels, even in the peak citrus, for example, production season, when you have, I mean, you go to the to Buzal Yurt, it's, and basically it's a pity, you see all the oranges, all the mandarins dropping on the ground, no one picking them because there's no market, and then you go to hotels, and you are offered uh, a packed orange juice made from concentrate, coming from I don't know where. And so you, there is no valorization of the local product. So start local, start educating the people, what they use, what they consume, and where it's coming from. Thank you so much. The lady over there. Ben özür diliyorum. İngilizce devam edemeyeceğim. Türkçe soracağım. Sorumu translate yapabilecek misiniz? <gülüyor> Fas ekibiyle burada şu an sizin verdiğiniz bir filmle tanıştım. Merak ettiğim bir şey var. Kurallarınız arasında Yere tohum kullanımıyla ilgili herhangi bir şey var mı? Bunu destekleyecek bir e, girişiminiz var mı? Çiftçilerimize bununla ilgili <gülüyor> bilgi veriyor musunuz? Çünkü ben e, biraz önce bayanın belirttiği gibi kendi evimde e, kurdum. Ama ne yazık ki yerel tohumlara ulaşamıyorum. Hep e, satın alma yoluna gidiliyor. Ve bunun da marketten alınmışlıkla aynı kalitede olduğunu düşünüyorum. Bununla ilgili herhangi bir girişimiz var mı veya kurallarınızda? Teşekkür ederim. Thank you. Yes, in fact, indeed, we are literally on the doorstep as a project to launch a, an initiative in this sense. So, what we've seen, what I've mentioned, is that basically there is an absence of dedicated training programs, education programs. Yes, you find higher qual qualification programs on masters, bachelors, or whatever it is, but there is nothing for the farmers. Uh, so, um, in collaboration with various stakeholders, we uh, are designing at the moment um, a vocational training program, curriculum, for, for farmers and for other rural stakeholders. Um, this will be launched basically, um, hopefully, end of the year, beginning of next year. So through this program, basically, we, uh, we aim to cover 
uh, both crop livestock um, uh, sectors and we want to introduce a variety of topics, a variety of subjects spanning from basic farm management tech, uh, practices, uh, technical te application of technology, uh, application of new practices, techniques and so on and so forth. So these courses will, uh, will be happening uh, regularly. Everyone will be, uh, basically participation is, is, will be free and open to, to anybody who is interested. And the interesting part, as I mentioned, is that we want to make a combination, combined use of not just theoretical training, but also practical demonstration on farms, demonstration on fields, on plots, exchange of experiences between the farmers, uh, using local exper expertise and experience, and matching that with international expertise. So I invite you to keep an eye uh, on our website, on the news, uh, and hopefully we'll see you also around for those trainings. Please. Thank you, Donald. Um, from uh, farm to table movement, is your program uh, has any improvement on this? And how, as a Cypriot going to a restaurant, know that this is actually from farm to table movement? Or will be. So, I mean, as I mentioned in one of the slides, um, uh, you, farm advisory service on its own uh, is, is it's, a, it's a tool. It's a tool for to implement the policy. So basically, it's, it all starts down. It's, it all boils down to to have the right policy environment, the right legislation, and the right financial package in place. So yes, as a, as a project, we have, uh, we have limited impact in, in this, obviously in terms of educating the farmer, in facilitating access to some financial support to start introducing some innovative projects which deal with some of these aspects. Um, but unfortunately, we also see on the other side that there are a lack of, there's a lack of um, the right strategies, the right policies in, in place, even when there is legislation. In many areas there is a lack of legislation, but when there is, there is lack of controls and enforcement. So that's why I mentioned also the importance of actually raising awareness and educating the consumer. I can say this also from another hat. I've been working in public administration in the Ministry of Agriculture for 18 years in Malta. Um, and many times you hear the, the farmers uh, complaining, but the ministry doesn't do this, the ministry doesn't do that. I mean, we want this support, we want this, this control, this is happening, this is happening. But many times it also boils down to uh, the fact that farmers, like any other industry, like any other business, they need to make the first steps themselves. So, through appropriate market, appropriate branding, appropriate uh, awareness raising, what's good, what's right, what's wrong, where, as I said, mentioning about uh, the, um, uh, added, for example, nowadays there is this movement that's also happening here about uh, more conscious consumer, what they eat, what they, what they drink, and where it's coming from. So the opportunities arising from organic farming, bioecological products, um, uh, so you don't need a farm advisor. Yes, you need that to, to, to support the producer to um, promote these new opportunities, but you don't need a, a ministry to support you in that. You can take your own initiative, you can promote um, yourself, your product, and, and this basically is a, is a process that will not happen overnight. Um, I can say, I can bring the practical experience again from Malta, where agriculture used to be, prior to the EU accession, used to be heavily protected. And lots of the incentives were linked with levies from imported, imported products, which basically destroyed any uh, form of quality or competition on the local, on the local market. And when the, EU, sorry, when the local farmers were overnight faced with single market, flooding of products from Sicily, from Italy, from everywhere, basically, um, the, the government was not there to help them. Basically, the farmers had to 
pull up their sleeves and uh, invest think of other ways, alternative ways, on how to actually ensure this, the, the, these aspects. And I can say, this survivor of agricultural sector in Malta was mainly due to the fact that, uh, was mainly due to, to, to consumer awareness. Uh, it took several years, several efforts. Yes, far, some farms went out of business, but when the consumer started to get aware about, yes, I can buy a fresh chicken, uh, I can buy a fresh carton of meat which had just left the farm six hours ago. I prefer that from a UHT carton of milk which has been on the shelf for two, three months. So, yes, it will take time um, and it's all, it will all boil down to the consumer in the first place.